But, you know, I went and saw a play, for example. You know, it was a silent play. It was one of the ones where they wear a lot of makeup and they, it's all about their facial expressions. It was so interesting. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the La Wani Lounge. Today we have with us the owner of the active nutritionist, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. How's it going? <laughs> I'm good, AJ. How are you? <laughs> I, I, I thought long and hard. Should I pronounce your last name or should I not? Or am I going to fuck it up? So I just went with Sarah. Sarah Stoddard. It's fine. Sarah. I know there's a gun range by your name. That's actually... Yeah, no, it is. The Stoddard yeah. gun range. Yes, yeah. there's one in Midtown. Right. I know. There is. I know. We don't know those people. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought, I thought it was like your uncle people. or somebody. I mean, it, it could be. It probably is some distant relative. But yeah, we don't know those people. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I was like, I don't, I don't know how to... How it's to... an English last name. It could be anybody. I'm sure I'm distantly related to them somehow. It's not it's that common of a last name. Possibly. Oh, possibly. yeah. Possibly. Yeah. I should go in and ask for rights to their company. It's fine. You can ask for a discount. Yeah, at least a discount, right? What? Hey, well, you're part I Asian, have right? the same last name. I should totally get a discount because I really want to own some guns, clearly. <laughs> don't sound like that. <laughs> 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 I don't think I don't think that that sound goes with with what you're trying to ask for. Yeah, no, it probably doesn't. I need to have a little more twang in my voice, mm -hmm. maybe like a maybe. little more. Just a little bit. <sighs> it's gonna be hard. Okay, you don't understand. My father, being from the north, beat into us as children that we were not to sound like Southerners ever. Well, like I cannot say y'all without. You say Having what? the fear you say of what? yeah yeah what I can't say it I can't say it because I, I couldn't hear you because 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 my dad wouldn't allow us it's you all or you guys that's it that's what we must say okay me and my brothers are the same we must say that we must say we must I, say that so so what you're saying is that like your English is also proper you don't use <sighs> the words like like. I just oh, said like, no, I like. say like like <laughs> a lot because like like in like I mean you know. That's what? just that's just Valley Girl, you know, California. We can adopt that. That's okay. That's that's okay English. It's just Southern apparently is not okay. Okay. So yeah. Southern, like East Coast Southern. Right. And West Coast Southern is fine. Right. Right. Because West Coast Southern would be like it's West basically Coast Mexico. I mean, it's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so sorry, tacos I'm are fine. <laughs> tacos. Tequila. Okay, I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> So, uh, so the scotch is working, huh? Yeah, it is. Oh, I feel great. A little, it's a little hot in here, though. It's a little toasty. So, I I remember the last time we met each other was about two, two and a half years ago, and our last conversation was about you starting your business. Um, mm -hmm. You, um, I think, uh, you told me like you were a clinical nutritionalist. Nutritionist. nutritionist. I always mess that up. Yes. It's like one of those nutritionist. words. Nutritionist. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and and you started your own thing. Um, yeah. So what is it? Like, what do you what do you actually do? You tell people like, hey, wake up in the morning and eat with seed potato, <laughs> turn vegan. Or something. Oh boy, um, I love bacon too much for that. Um, but no, I. So, long story short, I started. I had to start my own business. I had been wanting to start it, but the pandemic, ex like. It expedited that process for me uh, because I had no job. So I started my own business and I already had degrees uh, to be a nutritionist and uh, fitness professional. So that is my practice. So I basically I wanted I wanted a an approach of full wellness for people. So all around. So that's why I do fitness and nutrition. But the reality is even in all of my degrees, I took a lot of psychology classes because I have to understand behaviors. So what I do when I coach people and work with people is I work with their behaviors around health, how they see themselves, how they see health, how they see their bodies and all those things. So I'm obviously giving them uh, fitness and nutrition advice, but I'm also talking to the person, making it culturally relevant to them uh, for their lifestyle, all those things. But it is one-on-one -on -one counseling. So that's that's my passion is I like to build relationships with people. I like to um, really get to know the client that I'm working with and give them a product and a service that they can say, oh, this is really, this really helped 
me and changed the trajectory of my life. So I used to sport six pack abs back in the day in my 20s. And um, now that I'm, I'm in my 30s, uh, I love my scotch and my non bread too much. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know why I said non bread. Like this is <laughs> this, it's actually one of my pet peeves, like because non actually means bread. So you just said bread bread. I said bread bread. It's just like Starbucks saying chai And that's tea a pet latte. peeve of you and you just <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Because chai is tea. Chai is tea. Right, right. And I hear it so many times that in Even my head. Even if it's a specific I mean it is a specific type. There are other teas. But true. Yeah, but if you chai say chai means tea. Yeah, you can just say chai. But again, but it's still does it does it okay, question for you. Does it classify as a specific type of tea though? No. So it chai means just tea. means tea. It means tea in Hindi. So when Starbucks, for example, labels chai, it's saying, hey, this could literally be anything. This is a this is a this is an, a word that we took from another language. Even though we're identifying it as this one specific type of tea, it could actually mean anything. Okay, uh, question. Would, if you go to a Mexican restaurant, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, do they put their drinks as mojito mint lemon drink? I so, mean, so if they're trying to cater to an English audience, yes. <laughs> you. So what I'm saying is like you're okay to put mojito as a drink, but not chai as a drink. So mojito is not really an English word. Right? right. We are no, using absolutely the not. we are using the Spanish um, term term yes, for it. Right? Absolutely. So then, why are we not using chai or non to just to say that this is what it is? Right? You have you have ghee that is being used as an actual word, which is clarified butter. Right. You don't see ghee butter anywhere. Right. That's true. Or I don't know if you do. I I actually have to check the label next time I buy ghee because because I know if I go to a coffee shop, any coffee shop. And it says they have chai. I know to expect that it is a some sort of black tea base with spices. So is that inaccurate? I'm asking you. And milk. well, they don't always. But see, they don't serve it with milk unless you ask for milk. OK, so it's different in America. I am telling you from the mother. No, no, I, I want to know. I want to know. Tell me how America is doing it wrong because we do everything wrong. Let's be honest. Oh, well, I wouldn't say wrong. We'll call it the we, American version of yes, it. Yes, we 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 tweak things to fit our right. to to fit our uh, perceptions and our uh, comforts. Right. So one of the things is that um, so chai is something that people usually enjoy either in the morning or like if you're uh, if you have like a work day going on and you want to take a smoke break, essentially, right? Um, so so there's you have tea leaves. Um, you have stuff like ginger, cardamom, mm -hmm. uh, and other spices that go in it. Um, you bring it to a boil, add milk. That's the tea, right? So, but it still starts with that black tea base, right? But there's milk in it, so it's a milk tea. Yeah, yeah. Right. So black chai is is a specific type of chai. Mm. Traditionally, chai okay. always comes with milk. Yes. Right. But then in America, you have twelve readily available milk substitutes. Very true. Right. You can get it from a tree, a, a, a fucking leaf, or even seeds and like uh, almonds and cashews and oats and I, God knows what all. Like you would have any source to get you milk except tits. Like, like, <laughs> I was like, if it creates a white liquid, it can be called milk. Apparently. I, it's, it, isn't it just like nut juice? It is. Right. 100%. It's not really milk, right? Because, oh, no, no, no. no. Well, it's, because yeah. there are no tits to, um, uh, to an almond. Pretty, very flat, true. No, right? very true. Yeah. I think uh, there there is this uh, stand up set that Jack Jack Whitehall does. Okay. On milk substitutes, <laughs> I think you should definitely watch it. It's, oh, I will. It is. It is. I'm one, curious. The way he presents that is insane. He's like one of my I favorite comedians. But I appreciate that humor. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> but the thing with chai um, is, if you want to have black tea, you ask for black tea. Right. Mm. So um, that's how it is from where chai comes from. So if I went to India mm -hmm. and I wanted like I would say the the chai version of what I can get in the U.S. So black tea with milk, with spices. What would I ask for? Chai. Just chai. And yeah. that would that is exactly how it would be delivered to me. Yes. You just said chai. And that's the so, only that's the only version they have that, ex that exists. exists over there. Okay. If you want to order a special order 
and say, okay, now I just want the black tea part of it, they will have to make a whole new batch. Ah, that's interesting. Because they don't make it without milk at that all. That is the standard. So, so chai of, is black tea, milk, and spices. And can the spices vary? Okay, question. Why do you keep mentioning it as black tea? But It's just tea. So tea with milk. Well, because you have black tea, you have green tea, you ah. have you have white tea. There are other there okay, are so different types tea. of tea leaves. So regular tea. So it depends because the type of tea leaves is about when they're picked and how they're fermented. I know because I'm a okay. tea snob. Okay. okay. Keep talking. Yeah. So so that's that's why I specifically said black tea because we can go to a China black tea. They they pick it at a certain time. They ferment it a certain way. They process it a certain way. Right. And there's different types of China black tea. But when it comes to tea in India, I would be curious as to like, well, how do they, how do they, how do they produce it? What is tea to them? Is it all the same thing or can it be different? Can it be a green tea and they still call it chai? Can no, it be a white no. tea? It's black tea, right? Yeah, it's black tea. Okay. Black tea. okay. That's, that's all I needed okay. to know. So black tea. Well, a new thing I learned today. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Asian so, culture. Woo. <laughs> so I think um, for me, tea was black tea by default so if i don't mention what type of tea it's automatically black tea so you know you have like one of those things like the default value you got oolong there's so many types of teas and i mean herbal we won't even get into that that's technically not whatever like jasmine tea tea or whatever right all of those are types of teas but for me tea was black tea black tea yeah right that's why i asked yeah be specific cool um so yes black tea with with milk would be chai uh, and spices, Interesting. right? Um, Interesting. And and it's funny for me, like you could mention like cardamom chai, or I love or cardamom. like yeah, that's not the Indian way, that's Italian. <laughs> I know, I know it is, I know it is. I have too many Italian friends. It's fine. So uh, for for us, it, it it is weird. Like we we enjoy the fact that hey, there's representation here. Like oh, there's chai, which which by far. Like if if you're a tea snob, it is one of those things you always know about. Like that is like you know about Java coffee and you know about chai, right? That's like one of those things, right? Um, or if you're a wine snob, you know about champagne versus sparkling bubblies, mm-hmm. right? You know these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so so when I first saw this, I was like, tea tea, <laughs> what? And then people like. A lot of a lot of people would come and ask me questions like, "Hey, do you eat non bread?" And I'm like, "Bread, bread, red bread." <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it doesn't make sense because because just the way it's prepared, it's called different. Uh, so we have about eight to ten different types, maybe even more, based on permutation combinations of how many types of breads we can create. But is it all called naan or no. are there different names for so it? So naan is a specific type. It's a specific time, type. Okay. Right? So you have yeah. this yeah. Um, oh, all-purpose flour, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That you use to make bread or make make uh, a version of a tortilla. Right. And that's called a naan. Right. If you use um, wheat flour, it's called uh, either, like based on the thickness, it's either called a roti. Or, or where it's where it's prepared. So if it's prepared in on a pan, then it's called a chapati. Or if it's prepared inside a clay oven, it's called a tanduri roti. So like based on what flour you use, right? Yeah. Uh, you, and you can, how it's prepared. It and how it's like. prepared. There's a specific name, name for every for single yeah. thing. I appreciate that. Right? Uh, so it's it's interesting, but at the same time, I feel like I'm okay with the fact that there's less ignorance and there's more acceptance of the fact that these things do exist. And I love butter chicken with non bread. <laughs> Who doesn't? Oh, goodness. So delicious. Also, not one of my favorite things. And it, I mean, I don't... of course, there's there's so many other things. Uh, I, you know, I think I think it was actually the British that 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 put the I mean, that's their national dish. It's butter chicken. I know. How do you feel about that? I love it. <laughs> that like the whitest of white people. No, they were the colonists. So they were the colonists. So the East India Company, and they, they and and they took like a traditional Indian dish and made it their country's dish. Like that's like if you want really good butter chicken, apparently you go to the UK. 
You so, go to like London. So this is our version of reverse colonism. <laughs> So we colonized the British by we took over their food. Uh, oh, also, I love it. Um, also, their current prime minister Rishi Sunak uh-huh. is Indian. I yes, so, um, that's amazing. About, you, so, so you guys are basically just going in the back door route of like, hey, we're just gonna not back door. We did all of it legally. Oh oh oh! I'm not saying it was national illegal. dish and uh, prime minister. Yeah, and now we own the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> You got them right where you want them. Exactly. <laughs> it just took us 75 years. We got there. We got there. We managed But I appreciate that it was like, you know, calculated and patience. A lot of patience there. Like, hey, we're going to get them to love curry and spices so much because their food is so bland. We're going to get them to love this. And through this, we are going to infiltrate their entire system. <laughs> now, okay, I'll tell you a fun fact. Right? Oh so boy. Then, so Here we go. one of the spices that the East India Company came to India for was cinnamon. Yes, All right? I do know that. Cinnamon is the least used spice in Indian food. I've heard that. Okay. So that is true. Okay. Because yes, I'd heard that, but I'm like, I have no way of verifying this. Yes, this is. It's, so then, what is the what? So what what, the what are the most used? Just tell me that real quick. What are the most used? Most used. So you have salt. You have pepper, you have uh, red chili powder, you have um, coriander powder, mm-hmm. you have um, ginger, garlic, onions. Um, is turmeric up there? And turmeric. So those are all before cinnamon. Is yes, all saying. of them before cinnamon. I believe cinnamon that. would be something in like something sweet that we make, right. which is also very rare to use cinnamon in something that we use. So uh, why is cinnamon so important? To the Brits, or why yeah, was it? No. So here's the fun part, That's right? So, so they 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 came here for cinnamon. They enjoyed cinnamon so much that we Indians are responsible for the Christmas spirit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and the truth comes out. What do you feel about that? Oi, uh, oh, I mean cinnamon. I feel like though you know cinnamon is a big part of pumpkin spice and i feel like you guys might have inspired all the white girls yes thanksgiving (laughs) the entire month of like october (laughs) what about morning breakfast the cinnamon toast crunch oh boy wow you're taking it back to my childhood i'm just saying all of that indian (laughs) oh how little we know Hmm. well i appreciate it uh i think it's i think it's interesting that that Cinnamon was not a spice that was championed so much in India, and yet it's the spice that kind of took over the world. But it's also the spice that cost us our land. Like, ouch. You know, like, we're that like, hurts. we don't even give a shit you know, about cinnamon. Truth. Why it's, are you taking this country for it? That's, that's, oh, yeah, it's a sad truth. I've like, only take been all our to, cinnamon. I've only been to India once, mm-hmm. and the area I was in was Kerala. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes, you are. And, you know, it's the coast, southern coast. And I remember taking, uh, you know, some tours of the towns and stuff in that area. And they're like, yeah, so we have a few established buildings, but most of the buildings that are still here that are really old are from all our conquerors. Yeah. It's like, oh, here's the Jewish community. Here's the Muslim community. Here's the Christian, Catholic, mostly, community. And, oh, yeah, we got the Hindu community kind of sort of in that corner. And I was like, oh, oh, wow. Um, hmm. This has been a very, uh, this, this, this area is full of a lot of uh, people coming and basically taking over your, your, your culture and taking things from you. This is kind of depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, I wanted, it's interesting because I expected to go there and see more Indian things. And it was like, oh, well, no, this is uh, a lot of our most like prominent standing buildings have been churches or synagogues or temples that aren't necessarily Hindu. And I was like, wow, (laughs) that blew my mind because I never understood that, you know, until I actually went there. And I was like, oh, yeah, the spice trade, it was that was that really defined a lot of the history there. So I'm going to ask you a, a very controversial question. Go ahead. Um, what do you think when when you say I wanted to see more of 
India or Indian things. What do you think Indian things means? It's a very good question. And that's not something I feel I have a place to answer because I would have no, to I'm, know. I'm, I want to I yeah. understand what your version of Indian means. Like if, if you travel to India, what do you expect? Like, okay, this is what India is like or this is what being well, Indian means. Yeah, well, that's the thing is I went there not having any expectation and expecting to be educated. Right. And I was surprised... And obviously, I was only there for five days. So, and I could only stay in one little small region of an entire massive country. So, I know I was only get it, going to get a sliver of anything, but I still wanted to. I wanted to understand, like, whenever I travel, because I've traveled to a lot of countries now. I wanna. I go in with no expectations. I might come in with some. But they're usually quickly dissipated because it's never what you expect. But you go in and you're like, okay, well, I want to experience the food. I want to experience the people. I want to experience like because what we typically hear about as Americans, we hear about the politics. We hear about the poverty. We hear about, you know, struggles, triumphs. But it's only the most extreme things. So when I went there, I was like, okay, well, what is like a day to day life like? And. I was I was very surprised, I will say, just because I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I expected good food because I love Indian food. So I expected really good food and I and I absolutely got that. Um, you know, I expected uh lots of spice stores and I was able to buy tons of spices there and you know, uh uh but I it was interesting because I I never you, I can't you can't really and that's the thing, if, if you are really trying to understand a culture that is so different from yours, you have to show up realizing that everything you think you know about the place is probably either not accurate or just the smallest surface level of what's actually there. So I didn't know what to expect. And when I went there, I actually, I actually thought I was going to see the poverty and see just like despair right because everyone tells me everyone has told me right that oh they're so poor they're in their their way of life unless you're in like the the i don't know what percentage it is but of the higher class that life is hard that's that's what i was told so i went there and i expected to see a culture that struggled and it was just like maybe a lot of uh tension and I went there and I was like, oh, <laughs> everyone is so nice. And they're like, like I went to a wedding and they were all celebrating and they had food for everybody. And there was just such a joy that I experienced that humbled me because I'm like, if they can, they there still was obviously poverty. I saw a lot. I saw some of the places they were living and how they live their lives. And I'm like, yeah, I'm spoiled. I am so spoiled comparatively. But the community and the camaraderie and the relationships that I saw were so beautiful that that was one of the most humbling trips I actually ever went on was watching a culture just be so vibrant despite any of their situations and watching them care for each other and love each other in ways, not that it's perfect, right? But, and I only saw one small fraction of that country, but it, it definitely was one of those things that, this is why people need to travel and need to experience because I came in with, with ideas only based on what I had been told and even what I had been told by Indian friends. But I can't really know until I go there. So for you to ask that question of like, well, what did you expect? Or, you know, what is Indian culture? I'm like, well, it depends on probably, it probably also depends on the region they grew up in, their families, their personal experience, their personal lives, because everyone has a story, but, and what they've had access to growing up. Um, but I think, I think, the thing that is that is common to all of us is, you know, we're all human. We can all connect on a human level. We all experience the, these emotions 
trials and tribulations in various ways. Though for me, it was definitely humbling because I've never experienced trials like that in terms of not knowing where I was going to get my next meal or not sure if I was going to have clean water, if the water I was drinking was going to make me sick or not. Those are things I've never had to worry about. So to go to a country like that and to see where things like cinnamon come from, the thing that I enjoyed and on my breakfast cereal as a kid growing up, my spoiled little butt out of my silver spoon, right? It was just like, oh, I didn't expect this kind of richness behind it of a people who are just like, oh, yeah, cinnamon. Yeah, we like cinnamon. But look at all these other spices. <laughs> and not only that, yes, we have all this awesome food because, again, I love me some Indian curry. Um, That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Oh, I had to. It was there to no, take. No, <laughs> here we go. But, you know, I went and saw a play, for example. You know, it was a silent play. It was one of the ones where they wear a lot of makeup and they, it's all about their facial expressions. It was so interesting. So, you know, I could never, I could go to India probably a million more times and still not understand what Indian culture is. Because again, I didn't grow up there. I'm not Indian. I don't have brown skin, you know, but the fact that they were so inviting and welcoming to me in the world, that is like, ah, it's special. It's beautiful. I have so many questions for you. Okay. <laughs> okay. First of, first of my million questions. One, um, Earth is the third planet, right? From the sun? Yeah. So then that makes every country a third world country. <laughs> <laughs> That was so dad joke of you. <laughs> I, I'm, I, at this point, I'm like dad jokes all day. Yeah, all day. yeah, that right? checks out. Yeah, checks out. so um, my my <laughs> ex-girlfriend did not want to go to the gym with me. I told her it's not going to work out. Wow. <laughs> wow. I have tons wow. of all of these, but... I'm, uh, I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> but we're not going to get into that. Okay. Anyway, so my question to you is that... If you did not go in with expectations, how were you surprised? No, I. but I did tell you that I did have some expectations. I tried to go in without, I'll say this, I tried to go in with an open mind and, really that my, and realizing that my expectations were, were all going to be challenged and probably a lot of them changed. And they were. So um, what, we, what we really hear uh, on a day-to-day -day basis on, um, either the the Indian accent or what you hear about the food, what you hear about the language, what you hear about, um, you know, the uh, the social status or any of it, mm -hmm. right? All of it is so diverse. Like there are at least three or four Indian businessmen in the top 10 richest people in the world for a country that we associate as poor. Yeah. So you, you hey, see, we never like, said they were dumb. Right. <laughs> we I'm, never said that. So so Bill Gates once said that uh, you should treat nerds with respect because at some point you're going to be working for one. Oh, yeah. No, I've heard that many times. <laughs> that's a common one. Right. But um, yeah. That's, so but, the CEO know, of Microsoft is. Uh, I think, I think it's not even. it's not about intelligence. Right. Because obviously we could find we could find we can find brilliance anywhere. The question is opportunity. So I look at my opportunities growing up in the U.S. and I look at the opportunities growing up in India and I'm sure you can speak way more to that. I personally feel like I had way more opportunities. Not that I'm smarter than anyone. I just had more opportunities. But do you think that because you had easy access, or actually, let me rephrase that. Bef because you had easier access mm -hmm. than most people around the world, mm -hmm. do you think that a lot of people take that fact for granted? Oh, yes. And the fact Are you kidding that me? that is I think that's the American thing to do is to take what you have for granted. <laughs> uh, I, I, I also feel that I don't think it's just um, maybe maybe it's an American thing. Or even a because, Western society. Because I've seen country. I've seen Indians, the first generation immigrants. Yeah. 
respect struggle. Mm-hmm. And I have seen people that grew up here, even if they're not, like even if they were not born here, yeah. if they came here very early in their life yeah. and then they grew up here, yeah. for some reason they grow up entitled. Mm. And they discount the fact that their parents had to struggle so mm. hard yeah. um, and go through so many, you know, hoops and, you know, um, so many struggles in their lives, uh, leave their families behind, mm-hmm. come here, build the life so that their kids don't have to struggle as much as their parents did. Yeah. Um, and then they would grow up to despise their own parents for telling them to respect money, time, um, you know, values, family, whatever, whatever, you know, their cultural um, ideology is. Um, And, and they're only like, and one of the things that they constantly tell their kids is about their struggles. Like, Hey, you have no idea how you got here. Like the amount of struggle that I had to put, at least respect that. And then the kids take it as, don't give me this boring story. Like, I don't care if you walk to school. I don't care if you had clean water. I don't care if you had this or that, or, you know, if, if you did not um, eat four days in a row or whatever, what I care about is my Instagram's not working. And I cannot <laughs> talk to the four fake friends that I have. Oh, you mean first world problems? Yeah. Oh, I, uh, so <laughs> for me, I don't know how we define um, first world, second world, third world problems. I mean, um, it's just comedy. I think I think there point. are most countries that we consider third world that have a better GDP than the United States. Mm. I don't know how, what makes you an X world. Like, you know, yeah. you could you first yeah. world, second world, third world. Yeah. What makes you that if there are countries that 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 have a better GDP from a first world country, that have a better infrastructure than a first world country, mm-hmm. that have a better better healthcare ha- system. <laughs> so then America should not be even Ugh. like in the top twenty seven. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah. Canada should be a first world country. And all it is is a fifty first state. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like the the yeah. point that like how how are we defining like what makes you a, a like number one, number two, right. number three type of country? Oh, that's good. Good. You know topic. what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, when, yeah. when there's so many yeah, countries yeah. doing way better than you are. Okay. Well, let's. I mean, first of all, uh, I mean this can go off in so many tangents. Um, we'll take all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think it's it's capitalism that changed all this. Like basically democracy kind of turned into capitalism. So, I mean, that's, it's, it's definitely uh, who has the most money, who has the most power and influence that became sort of this number one, right? Or number two, whatever. Anyway, the I top. I have a question then. Go ahead. What, it, how, what, how high would you rate negative three trillion? <laughs> I, I just want to under oh yeah well, no. debt is oh, negative, right? so oh, yeah. like, how, how much again, money do you it, think is negative three so trillion? i'm not i'm not gonna talk uh too much on finances because this is not an area of expertise for me okay. but at the same time it's 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 interesting because how can a country be in that much debt yet still have so much power so debt is clearly not the thing that causes us to not have power. Okay. Right? Do you think that America does have power at this point? There are countries that have backed out of the whole oil, like dollar being the uh, yeah. the currency for it, oil. It probably depends on which, which uh, field you're asking in. Do we still have power? Well, yes. But in what sense? Well, probably not as much as we think we do because obviously we depend on countries like china right if china backed out we would be finished or if they said hey we want all our money back that you've borrowed from us we'd be in a lot of trouble what happens if china takes taiwan oh okay now we're getting really (laughs) political (laughs) you know what i'm saying yeah 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 the entire semiconductor industry it's it's yeah it's uh that's gonna be an interesting one and right. I've been very curious as to what the U.S. is gonna do about that because it's 
that was where we drew the line at one point. And I'm curious is like, it's like saying, hey, if you cross this line, like we're going to have problems that that I think like that is actually where the U.S. drew the line. And so I'm curious is if if the U.S. is actually going to keep that line if we're act, or if we're going to continue to pull the line back, because I think that is what we've been doing for China. We've been kind of like, OK, well, I guess you can get away with this. OK, well, I guess you can get away with this. But that was that was a hard line. So I'm curious if the U.S. is going to step in on that one. Question. So then do you think Ukraine was a line that U.S. drew? Ooh, I think I think Ukraine was a line that they drew initially and then a line that they that wasn't solidly drawn. It was drawn in sand and not in stone. So fun fact, since the war started, United States has bought 10 billion dollars worth of energy from Russia. Oy, I'm not surprised. Um, so they're funding the war on both sides. I'm not surprised. I I don't so he, I I don't know uh, all the facts and details of yeah. these political matters, but yeah, yeah I, feel free. I just do a lot of research. Yeah, <laughs> like feel for free me, for to me, for to me. talk to to yeah. talk about it. So one of the things is that um, since since the world wars started, right? Um, in not not the first one, but the second one, yeah. right? The nineteen forty five. That's where the second one ended, right? Um, United States was not even part of it. It, it actually forced itself into the war by provoking Japan to attack them. Hmm. Right? So it was just like a whole play. Yeah. And since I, then, I've, I've United States has theory. made money on selling arms. Right? So, this mm -hmm. is a big, so 40% of the budget goes into uh, defense, a lot of it in building arms, mm -hmm. and a lot of it, a lot of income comes from selling those arms to uh, to countries like Iraq, Iran, um, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Colombia. You name it, right? Pakistan. You name a country that that has this civil unrest, and you look at the weapons they're using. All United States, right? So now we come to a point where where Nuclear energy um, is something that United States wants. Russia has a lot of it. It's using the money that it gets from Ukraine by selling weapons and gives that money to Russia to buy energy. Hmm. Which is interesting because now Ukraine's money is going into Russia. So essentially, Ukraine is funding um, Russia to attack them. While United States is making profit off it, I mean, right? We all know that the U.S. is but here's the a fun capitalistic thing. Now, here's, society and right. based off of money over so he, everything else. So here's the fun part. Now, since United States is not stopping Russia from this continuous attack, right? Mm -hmm. And this war has been going on for years now, more than a year, right? Yeah. Um, that's why I said years. <laughs> um, in in the fight between Taiwan and China, Russia is on China's side. So if Russia and China are together, you have a, a country where you're totally re relying on this country for power. And you have this other country where you're totally relying on all the electronics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, all of the other resources resources that come from China. Yes. So you have two countries that you're relying on and you have to go against them to yeah. protect Taiwan. There is no way Taiwan, like if China decides tomorrow, like, hey, I want to attack Taiwan, United States cannot interfere Could, because... It if Russia and China come together, dire consequences. Yes, yeah, yes. Like United States will be <laughs> to our, done within to our 24 economy, hours. To our, a, everything, there would be right. dire consequences for sure. And nobody even has to use any kind of force. It's just like, hey, give me my three, three trillion back, mm. and you, I will cut off your power. That's it. I'll cut off your oil. I'll oh, cut off your power yeah. because Russia right now is very tight with all the oil producing countries, mm -hmm. right? Including Saudi. Mm -hmm. So two of the biggest uh, oil producers in the world 
being Russia and um, and Saudi, both of them are together, and both of them said we're not going to use dollar anymore. So the currency is devalued, right? And and I think it was Richard Nixon or one of one of the U.S. presidents that turned U.S. dollar into a fiat currency. So it's, it no longer has to rely on gold; it relies on public's trust. That's why dollar has kept its kept its value mm. because the propaganda still is U.S. is superpower. Is it really though? And the only reason I can talk about it is because now I'm a citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations! Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I became a citizen like eight months ago. Eight months ago, and you didn't let me throw you. Uh, coming to America party. I was like, why'd you, why'd you have like a big pause after you didn't let me throw you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where was I supposed to be thrown? <laughs> like, hey, I, I work out. So you know that I probably could throw you. Probably not very far, but still. But you know I work out too. Yeah. That doesn't, and, and, uh, and one of my thighs is your body weight. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you think I weigh? How much do you think I squat? You told me already, actually earlier. Yes. 500 something. And That's a hack squat. Something. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So hack squat is over 500 and my regular squat is over 350. You're so proud of yourself. I know. It's twice my body weight. You're proud of a number. It sounds like capitalism. Oh! <laughs> I'm, I'm proud of a multiplier. Also, Indian. Number. Yes, I am proud of numbers. Yes. You guys are good at math. Okay, you got that. A lot of well, math are, geniuses over there. You are part Asian, so you know I you, am. Should, you should like share this. I got a little bit of that love for numbers. Know? Yeah, I got a little bit. I'm only a quarter Asian, so I think only 25 percent of me can appreciate that. <laughs> so, so you said you're you're a quarter Asian. Um, so then. Do you do you feel that that you're less entitled than most people uh, that you come across? Okay, well, I mean, I wouldn't say I would say I'm less entitled, but only because of my experiences. Not like I had every opportunity to be entitled because again, and I'm glad you brought this back up because my so my grandmother came over from Japan and she you know, she had to, it was the whole thing. She had, she was completely disowned from her family. She was in an arranged marriage that she didn't want to be in. And so she ran away with an American soldier. <laughs> Yay. Um, but hey, if she hadn't have, I wouldn't be here. So thank you, grandma. Um, but. What, was this before or after Pearl Harbor? <laughs> <laughs> after, actually. It was, it was when I think my grandfather, my grandfather was in that war. But I think they met during the occupation of Japan. So after all the stuff happened and pretty much the war was over and dying down, the, you know, the U.S. occupied Japan for a mm -hmm. long time. My grandmother was working as a translator because she came from a pretty wealthy family. And I thought you were going to say because she was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> she found this American soldier and she no, was like, no, she was she was working. At, so she was take me home. She country was brilliant. Road. <laughs> <laughs> no, she came from a wealthy family. And again, they had an arranged marriage set up for her. You know, they were all uh, Buddhist. And here was this, you know, uh, very white American soldier who was stationed in Japan. They met and I think they even uh, got married and had their first child there before he got stationed back in the U.S. Um, but her family completely disowned her and told her to never come back. It was, it was pretty serious. And, you know, they didn't have a lot of money. Um, he wasn't Who like was a, they? my grandmother and grandfather. They didn't have a lot of money starting off. So you said that they come from a wealthy family. No, no, no. My grandmother did. Right. The wealthy family that disowned her. Oh, so now she got said, no money. That said, "Hey, you, you're not our daughter anymore." Such yeah. an Asian thing to do. Such an Asian thing. It's an honor shame system. I it's know. pretty tragic. I know. It's just a shame based again, society. If 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 she hadn't have done that, I would not be here. So I'm very grateful for that. But anyway, so she comes to the U.S. when the when the Japanese are being put in concentration camps, 
And so what does she do? She's like, well, I have these, you know, half Asian kids and apparently the Japanese or, or anything Japanese right now in the U.S. is is frowned upon. So I'm going to try and remove that culture from them as much as possible. It's a very uh, interesting thing. Go ahead. Question. Question. Um, so Oppenheimer came out this week. Did you, did you watch that? <laughs> no. I, it just, it just no, hit me. No, I haven't yet. But but I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that movie. You know, uh, maybe, maybe you should go f- to that movie. Yeah. The no, I want Oppenheimer. To. Yeah. Have you seen it? No. I okay. Haven't. All right. And, and it just hit me. Because, we will reconvene on um, this. Um, World War II, Japan. Oh, I watch a lot of World War II movies. It, Oppenheimer. Come on. He was he was a part of. Well, I think he led the the invention of the whole atomic bomb that was used in Hiroshima yep, and Nagasaki. Yep, yep. I yeah. Uh, which I, ended I'm, the war I'm and everything. really looking forward to that movie. I. Yeah. And the guy from Peaky Blinders in, is in I it. I know. Oof. He's, what's his name? Tommy Shelby. No, well, no, no, it, it, no. The actor. Come <laughs> on. Know, but know. he's so good. He's such a good actor. I've yeah. loved him in all the movies he's been into. Anyway, um, yes, I know. We're getting off track. But when. Also, can I say one more thing? Go ahead. Before that. Um, so Oppenheimer, when he actually creates the atom bomb, uh-huh. he uses a quote from Gita, which is the Indus, Indian religious text. Okay. And he says, now. I am death, the destroyer of worlds. Oh, it's a boy. quote from Gita. I'll How think, do you feel about that? I don't know. <laughs> so I feel like at some point he's like, well, I guess he read the Gita. <laughs> and Clearly. Second, he fucking destroyed a world. <laughs> you know, like an entire so interesting. Oh, yeah. civilization. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, I, I think that um, based on the stories I've heard about Oppenheimer, he regretted every single... Uh, decision that well, he I made. Think, I think that's re- actually. I, I watched the preview for that movie, and it looks like they they talk about that in the movie. So I'm curious. We should we should go watch this. Movie. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do let's, it. Let's plan this. Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So continue with your. Um. So with grandma. with back into um, kind of the entitlement thing. So you know, it was my grandmother that came over, and my father was half. But again, he was he was raised. So they they mostly grew up in New Jersey which is why I don't, I'm not allowed to have a Southern accent. Uh, Yeah. Use guys is more appropriate than (laughs) y'all in my, in my grammar. Um, But anyway, uh, but, but interestingly enough, again, my grandmother took, tried to actually take a lot of that culture out so that her kids wouldn't be so ostracized. And so I didn't, you know, she didn't teach any of her kids Japanese. It was mainly the food that we got. So their experience is very different because it wasn't like, it wasn't like a couple from Japan coming over, right? It was an American who grew up with all of that, marrying a woman who grew up more entitled in her country, even though she had rejected that and come over. So, so I would say I grew up pretty American, even though I have the Japanese there and I was very influenced by my grandmother and learned a lot from her, mostly, again, food related and, you know, some small cultural pieces. I had every opportunity to be sort of the standard white person, (laughs) you know, like I look I look pretty American. I mean, I've got you can tell I got something in me, but it's not that prevalent. Right. I know you want to say something right now. <laughs> yes, so say you, it. you do have Asian features. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Come I on. do. Yes, I do. It's very obvious. I'm also very animated. So do you think do you think your <laughs> grandfather was the pioneer of American bringing an Asian lady to this country? <laughs> I think that started long before him. Um, like but I got, he, I want, he helped. I want one of those. He helped. <laughs> it's like, I want one of those. <laughs> oh, stop it. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Have your fun. Have your fun. Um, but when we're talking about entitlement, that's an interesting thing. Because I, so I didn't get that experience of having foreign parents. My parents were both born here. But my dad got that experience a little bit of having a foreign parent. But it was also, you know, my dad didn't grow up entitled at all because they were poor, you know. So I think I think what matters more is, you know, uh, I think 
one, your opportunities do matter. The opportunities that you're just naturally given as a child, but also what you see around you. So if you grow up as a child in this country, even if you're poor, but you see the opportunities that everyone else is getting, you're going to want that. And I think that's valid, fair, right? You're going to say, oh, well, why can't I have that? But I think that becomes a question of like, okay, so it's it's part opportunity. It, and and so when you talked about like, oh, there's this entitlement, even if someone doesn't have the opportunities, because we look at like a lot of like African American communities and obviously they have a harder time than someone like me. Um, and yet there's still this entitlement. Uh, so we have a lot of questions as so, okay, well, why does that happen? Um, and I think it, that's why I said, I think it depends not just on the opportunities that you actually have, but the opportunities that you see happening around you in, uh, in your culture, in your country. And maybe you can speak more onto this as to what you experienced oh, I will. in India <laughs> or in, uh, Dubai, right? Because you you mainly grew up in Dubai, right? I, I I was born in Dubai, but I mainly grew up in India. Oh, okay. So I had that backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe you can speak on that. And um, what what did you see? Because first of all, do you consider yourself entitled in any way? I don't know. Maybe at some level. I don't know. Like I, I wouldn't call myself 100% something. Like yeah, I, I yeah. know like everybody's it's, on a, it's a spectrum. spectrum. Right. Yes, it's right? a spectrum. <laughs> so I'm not hundred percent good. I'm not hundred percent bad. I'm not hundred percent entitled. I'm not hundred percent not entitled. Right. You are the product of your experiences. Exactly. Right. Um I thoughts. do feel I do feel like growing up in India and then coming here, I realize there are so many things that I'm in total disagreement of. One of them being consolation prizes. Like mm. So for me, it's like, as soon as you come out of like, school- Are we talking it, participation trophies? Yes, participation <laughs> trophies, right? Oh yeah, we all think those are BS. Right? Uh, I, I don't think most people do. Well, right? okay. So, so let, let me we finish, all let me and me and my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, um, it's like, hey, um, I'm like, you're getting a participation trophy. Mm -hmm. Like you're getting a, a trophy just for trying. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's like, that is what we should be doing. Like somebody is giving you a trophy just for being normal. Just for showing up. Just for showing up. Right. And then people think that just showing up sh is, is enough. enough. Is enough. And we spoke about this, about relationships, <laughs> about all of this. Uh, bef oh, yeah. Right before we had this conversation yeah, yeah, that yeah. Uh, people, people were like, hey, if we just show up, that should be enough. I'm deserving of X, Y, Z, fill in right. the blank. My, my thing is you deserve nothing. Right. You earn everything. Yeah. You eat what you kill. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's that's about it. If you don't kill anything, you're going to you're gonna so die hungry. So how did hungry. you get there, though? How did you get to that conclusion? Well, because I was born like that. I okay, was born so tell into, me about your experience. So I was born into what I would call below poverty line well, I was I was born to a family that was middle class in Dubai. Okay. <laughs> but then we moved to India in 1992, and then there were uh, we went to we moved to Bombay, and there was um, and my dad wanted to set up his own thing, um, and there was this huge riots, bomb blasts, all of that, which kind of basically tanked my dad's business. Oh yeah. So like it was. It, it, it was a set of so many unfortunate events mm. that we went from middle class to like below poverty line, mm. right? Um, so much so that we would have to like walk a kilometer f away from our house with buckets of, uh, with buckets to fill clean water to bring it back to our house so we had clean water for the day, right? So we could drink something. Um, so yeah, that's that's... And, and I won't go into details of no, it no. because everybody has their own struggles and I don't want to, you know, make yeah, this. Yeah, but I want to hear about your experience. Right. So for me, it was like the whole idea was like you eat what you kill. 
um like respect is something that has to be earned no matter what like you don't deserve anything, anything. you got to earn every single thing like it be it be it in life be it in relationships be it in your company be it whatever you don't deserve anything like you could be um Steve Jobs but if you're applying for a job somewhere at Microsoft for example they need to earn your respect you need to earn everything that comes with your talent you got to earn it yeah you just cannot walk in and be like and hey and have expectations I, right that i am steve jobs i'm i am now applying for a job which technically you shouldn't be because you're steve jobs right <laughs> so if you really think you are that big of a personality mm -hmm. then you shouldn't be asking or begging something for something from somebody if you are at that level then you need to humble yourself mm. and you need to realize that if i am in this position then maybe i shouldn't be entitled mm. maybe i shouldn't have this ego that i already have like i am not i am not as big as i thought i was let me humble myself let me earn my way back. i'm not saying that that you don't have the talent for it yeah. but uh but there's this old text from 16th century by a chinese general called the art of war. Oh. Yeah. Right? I've by Sun Tzu. Yep. Right? And he mentions in that book that a, a a man's biggest enemy, well, back then, you know, it was all about man being used as a gender neutral term. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Uh just trying to be PC. That's neither here nor <laughs> I'm there. trying to be PC. Yeah, that's neither here <laughs> right? nor there. We're not talking about that. Right? Continue. So a man's biggest enemy is his ego. Hmm. right and there is this very old saying even in the gita which is like thousands of years old mm -hmm. and, and it says um insaan ka sabse bada dushman uska ahankar hota hai which is translated to a, a man's biggest enemy is his own ego mm. right like so that. so I over like the that. years like thousands of years people there there are So did you grow up with that principle? Was yes. that just kind of ingrained in you? Honestly, was that taught to you? Honestly, this was said to me and I shoved it off. Mm. And I was very egotistical. Okay. And it destroyed a lot of things in my life. Mm. Um and in retrospect when when I got to a point like after my teenage when I was done with my rebellious phase and everything. Are we I, ever really done with our rebellious phase? I think you can be. <laughs> I'm just I kidding. Th I think, no, yeah, continue, yeah. continue. I think you continue. can be. Um, but yeah. you just prioritize what you want to achieve out of certain things. So when I got to a point when I was like, "Hey, there are things that are bigger than, um, bigger than I thought they were." Yeah. Um, and the only thing that was stopping me was the fact that I thought I was too, um, maybe I was too big for it, or maybe I was too smart for it or maybe yeah. i was too xyz for it it was somehow beneath you yes it was beneath me um and then i realized that what i was doing was just putting walls in front of me and i was just banging my head on it mm. like i wasn't moving forward just because i was like not for me too small for me mm -hmm. i'm too big for this i'm too mm -hmm. xyz for this mm -hmm. and and then you know um I I read some books. I'm I'm not a big fan of self-help books uh because you know I feel that they're all somebody's perspective. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, everybody's well, perspective they are. Right, right? And everybody's <laughs> perspective drives their reality. Uh, you can pull out some good points out of it. Yeah. That will that you can connect to your life. But most of it is somebody else's But it's still your choice how sure. you live your life. Sure. Um so Ultimately. for me it was like I got to a point where I was like, I'm, I'm a problem solver. So I wanted to find what the root cause of all oh, of my struggles were. You and were. I, this is why you and I are friends. Right here. We we both have the savior complex. <laughs> <laughs> all right. well, we, we have will, a lot more in common than just that. We, will, yes. we, will, we will get to the Messiah complex at <laughs> some point. <laughs> but <laughs> Oh no! But but the point for me was like, if if I am in this position where where... I do not find this root cause of my problems. Right. Um then then that's not good. So you I'm, struggle with it. Because yeah. because I think you and I cannot handle just looking at the symptoms. We have to understand, well, 
why do I, why did I get this in the first place? Why am I here? So I want to ask you in terms of the, uh, when we're talking about this entitlement thing, because I appreciate your perspective so much. So I want to, I want to ask you, do you think your perspective happened because of the environment you grew in, the things you were taught? Um, uh, I'm sure it played a role or was there more like, because did you see other things in your environment that also taught you that that everything has to be earned? And as you grew up, was there were there things that tried to combat that? Like was there was there any sort of input from other people or maybe moving to the US, for example, that made you feel like, oh, maybe I am entitled to certain freedoms, rights, et cetera, et cetera. Or like how how did that specific concept manifest into the man that you are today? So that's a multifaceted answer. I'm sure. Right? Okay. Answer so, how you want. All right. So we will talk about entitlement um, growing up. One of the things is that because I had nothing, so I did not start off as entitled. Um, and I yeah. do think like, you know, nature versus nurture. Mm -hmm. I do think because of how I grew up, I did not start off as entitled because I did not have anything to be entitled about. Right. Right. That's fair. And while growing up in the 80s and 90s in, in India, it was a very competitive world where, you know, like um, there were no there were no free like you you had to actually memorize every single thing before an exam there were no calculators there were no open book exams there were no mm -hmm. you know like hey um, oh you mean the hand holding that they do now in college yes. Yes. oh okay okay so cool, 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 cool. we didn't have all of that so <laughs> so i had to actually memorize the tables so you actually I, had to learn exactly oh okay right cool so so i actually had to learn what a rhombus is and all of that you know what i'm saying like, <laughs> no like I, I, I know what you're saying and like i had to actually calculate or understand how um, mm -hmm. you know the sine uh, cosine and you know all of that did you, work did in you believe that you had opportunities that you could have more did you did you see other people around you and think like oh I could have that too like yes okay so what uh, how did that drive you also um I so I was a smart kid um and I did I did achieve a lot. We're not going to go into to details of it's boring details, um, but I, I did achieve boring. a lot of a lot. I know of, your story. <laughs> <laughs> I I did achieve a lot of things because I knew I could make it, um, and I strived hard for it. It's not that. But you uh, knew you had to work for it. Yes, yes. Like so, the, everything you saw around you, like validated that you're like, oh, if I want this, I have to work for it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, like I have to like. If so, yeah. So why in the U.S. do we have entitlement and feel like we don't have to work? So there is there is one of these these it. old sayings, right, um, that that are that is very popular. One of the things is that um, strong situations or difficult situations make strong men. Strong men make weak situations. Weak situations make weak men. Weak men make strong situations or difficult situations. Interesting. So I think in America, we're at this point where you have all these immigrants that came to this country, uh -huh. right? With all of their struggles and built something out of it. Yeah. Right? They built the weak situation. Hmm. And now we're in that era where all these weak men well, okay, so I want to talk... Or not men, but, you yeah, know, yeah, like... Yeah, no, just like in general, we, I know you're talking people about people. exist, and I think they're going to create tougher situations that will give rise to the non-entitled next generation. Okay, because... So one of the things that I've looked at historically, and I, th I think this is interesting, I'm not going to quote this right, and I don't know where it came from, but I've, I've read on this, is, you know, we talk about the different, like you know, uh, necessities of life. So what do we need? We need food, shelter, water, safety, you know, food, clothing and shelter. Yes. All these things. Right. So when you, when you're in a culture or an environment, say like you come from a country of poverty or a country where war is present and that's where, that's how you grow up. You're struggling for those very basic needs. 
And if you say to yourself, hey, I want to set up the next generation, like so my kids or maybe my grandkids, because I'm struggling for these basic needs. So if I can guarantee basic needs for the next generation, hopefully they can build upon that. So I kind of look at it as this, right? So a lot of the immigrants that come to like say the US, for example, uh, they're struggling for their basic needs because they have to figure out how to make it in a completely new environment that is not set up for them. So they're struggling like, okay, how do I provide for my family, make sure there's food on the table, shelter for them, clothing for them, and also give them the opportunity to really explore their own passions. So again, the 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 family that comes over or the family that struggles, goes through war, goes through poverty, they don't have the opportunity to be creative, to study the arts, because they have to focus on food, shelter, water, clothing, right? So if they can get to the point where they can say, okay, but I'm going to set it up. Like I'm going to, it's like the man who says, I'm going to plant trees that I'm never going to get to stand under and, and, and feel their shade. It's for the future generation. I have an example for this. Right. But I'm, but so the idea is like, okay, we, your family sets you up to be able to so say your 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 family came over and they 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 created a way for you to um to have all your basic needs met so that you could finally explore your passions you know i think sometimes entitlement comes from that because if you set up your kids so well to the point where okay they don't have to worry about their basic needs you got them on that now they can explore their passions. They can explore art. They can explore creativity or or science or anything that they're interested in. Then they, I feel like it's hard to teach that child that, hey, these basic needs I had to work for. And so you're complaining about not getting to have your creative perfect job that aligns with all of your quote unquote, first world needs. And so, you know, I, I think that's where a lot of the disparity comes from. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is like, I do think we we don't, as the, as the generation that didn't have to strive for it, and you might not even, you might not even consider yourself part of this generation because you had to strive for everything you got. I consider myself part of this generation because I didn't. My parents provided all of my basic needs for me and made sure, like my dad's no longer here, but he made sure my mom and my family were set up for life so that we will never have to struggle for at least our most basic needs. That gives us the freedom to explore our passions, our desires. So so it is harder for me to come into that and say, oh, well, because I get to explore my passions and desires and I never had to struggle for my most basic needs, it is harder for me to appreciate them. It took a while. Like I had to get to places where I saw my basic needs being taken from me or at least seeing it in other people and in people that I love and people that I care about for me to say, oh, this isn't something that is just that I should feel like I deserve. I have to work for this too. And I have to work for this for my future generations if I so choose to have children. This is why we are friends. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that that I've always noticed is that like if 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 you or actually most of the people that I know that were born here yeah. or grew up here. Yeah. Especially if they were from like uh, like they were born um to immigrant parents yeah uh who who grew up very poor and you know spend their entire life around work right. because they had to find a way to collect enough money so that their kids don't have to deal with all of that all of them assholes <laughs> um <laughs> I also dated one of them, <laughs> but oh, um, neither but, here nor there. But continue. Yes. <laughs> um, but but it gets to a point where when do you when do you realize like hey um, 
this struggle is not just my struggle. This struggle is a family struggle, right? Mm -hmm. So their struggle and whatever they're expecting, like, you know, we it's like parents put expectations on their kids, right? Oh, yeah. Well, because they did X, Y, Z to get to where they are today, they want their kids to at least respect their struggle. Right. Maybe not understand it, maybe not follow it, maybe not even do anything around it. But, respect but at least it. respect the fact that, well, hey. Well, some parents have all those expectations <laughs> of their kids. I, I think a lot of... But, I but think, a lot of them are more open. I think that they would still have expectations of respect. Yes. Oh, for sure. That's a that's a baseline. Right. Like I don't like if appreciate if I, where you come from. Exactly. Right. Yeah, um and I roots. and I see a lot of people don't really acknowledge where you come from. Yeah. Right? Uh, because there are so many struggles involved in this entire journey of where you are today. Like there are multiple generations that went through XYZ for you to get to where you are today. Right. So so I think, and it's also how many generations removed because you had to come here on your own and create your own life. Whereas like me, I'm several generations back. It's not even like my dad still had the opportunity to be entitled because it was his parents or parent because it was only one of them that came over from another country. So like imagine most of the kids in the U.S., it like – it, it's been generations, like multiple generations before their first, you know, they first came from whatever country they came from, unless they're Native American, which there's so few of them anymore anyway. Right. But um, to see that, like, I think there's more potential the more removed you are from that situation, too, because I can't even fathom what that's like because I was only around my grandmother for I think 17 years before she passed. So I'd only know, I only know some of her stories. I don't know all of her stories. So I can't even, I can't even fully understand the weight of what she had to go through because she's not even here to tell me. So imagine someone else, like another kid in the U S who it's, it was their great grandparent that came over. I mean, they, they probably didn't even meet their great grandparent. So, yeah, so for me, that is that is very important. Like, unless unless you understand humility. Yeah. yeah. And you realize like, hey, this is the path that my family took yeah. to get to where we are today. To really like, appreciate uh, it. You know, like I understand back in the day when, um, you know, there were land bridges everywhere and people would migrate on foot and this and that whole nother story. Now we have an immigration system everywhere. Yeah. Right. Um, and there are different opportunities, different places like you would see, like even right now in India today, you have like the Apple factory set up there, Tesla factory set up there. Like there are there are multiple opportunities now in India, yeah. right, yeah. It, which which are at least 200, 300 times more than there were when I was growing up, Interesting. right? So there's there's like a huge potential now. Um, and and I totally enjoy the fact that, hey, there there are things that are uh, that are moving there. There's innovation there. And, you know, um, like if you call tech support, you're calling somebody in India, right? Um, <laughs> Pretty much. But but you understand like there there is innovation there and not everybody gets the opportunity yeah. to come to Silicon Valley, right? Um, and they are all doing what they're what they're able to do in their capacities. Yeah. Right. But when you when you grow up here and and you feel like, hey, I am better than the generation that was before me. For me, what you're telling me is that I don't respect where I came from. Mm. Two, I feel that I deserve this mm. and not the fact that my my family tree like all of it right yeah, like yeah. like if even if it's like great grandfather or like uh, a great grandmother or like great 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 like right. whatever your ancestral tree got you to a good place and i'm not just saying united states like it could right. be uk oh, yeah. it could be australia it could be wherever your specific opportunity lies right right like at that point what i feel is that if you don't understand where you came from, if, if you do not internalize the fact that 
it's your family struggle, if mm. it's your lineage struggle, that you will never get to a point where you understand the real value of where you're standing right now. Like that one square yeah. foot of, of area under your feet right now is such a privileged mm. piece of land that you're standing on right now that you don't even realize like it, it yeah. and you did not, like for you to be standing there you didn't. at 17 years old yeah. you didn't do shit to get there right you were just boop there so yeah let's talk about that because so i want to talk about the the potential solutions to that because a kid can't help it that they grew up with a lot or a little sure. right uh -huh. So the question in my mind becomes, well, how does someone who grew up in, say, my situation get to the point of humility to realize, oh, I didn't do anything to give myself this foundation. My parents or grandparents or whoever did. And I'm only building upon that, you know, and one thing I will say to that is my own personal experience. So thinking about, you know, I told you about my uh, grandmother um, walking away from a wealthy family and an arranged marriage because it wasn't the life she wanted. And she chose to be poor with my grandfather in the U.S. for a while. <laughs> Um, D didn't one of the monarch do it too recently with Meghan Markle? What was the uh, who's the like the British monarch? Uh, I think it was Harry. Yeah, Prince Harry. Mary, Prince Harry. Meghan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He did the same I thing. mean, you know, <laughs> it'd be like that. I mean, a, a Hollywood actress, you know, that's comes from such poverty, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway. No, but it's interesting because I I I know that I could never it's like I I heard my grandmother's story and I appreciate it. I respect it, right? I'm like, wow, like if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be here. And I knew that, but I didn't actually really get humbled by that or appreciate that until recently. Because so in the story of uh my my grandmother, my grandmother, I would say Although she didn't come from monetary poverty, she came from poverty of like real love and relationship with her family. Because if a family can say, hey, you're no longer my daughter, how much do they really love you? Right? I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot in there, but we're not going to go into that. But one of the things I want to point out is like for me to understand my roots I had to understand my grandmother's situation. And I only recently started to understand that because, and I don't even understand, I'll never understand the full extent of being able to walk away from everything you know, your home, your life, your parents, your sister, she had a sister, probably all her friends and because because they had a certain expectation and demand of her that she was like, I can't fit that mold. I don't want to be in this arranged marriage. I don't want to, you know, I don't know all the nuances of what she was going through and I never will. But, um, you know, I'm an experience. I was I just recently uh, I've been in an experience where I realized like the guy that I'm that I'm dating now is totally different from my family and from my upbringing. And this was the first time that my family was resistant to that. And I felt the pressure to choose either go along with what my family expects of me or be in this relationship with a man that I really care about. Oof. And that was the first time that I was like, oh, I get it. I get it when I when I was thinking about my grandmother and her stakes were so much higher than mine will ever be, you know, um, because she was also moving countries, you know, she was marrying a man that was going to take her to the U.S. where they didn't accept the Japanese at the time. 
So it was very humbling for me to even be slightly in that experience and realize, oh, wow. Imagine everything she had to sacrifice to you, come here. You know, they still don't accept the Japanese, right? <laughs> well, example MSG. Oh, boy. Here There is no go. scientific proof for it being bad for us. <laughs> Still, still taboo. Okay, I'm Sorry, a nutritionist continue. as well, so we're not going to go into that. But, uh, but yeah, so I think with my question to you, and I want to hear from you after this, um, you know, what will it take for someone who does grow up in an environment like, say, you, if you have children, you would want to set them up for opportunities and if success. It's a big if. I'm not saying you will. I'm saying nothing to when. that. When? Oh, okay, when. Okay, I didn't know if you wanted kids. I okay. Do. So when you have your own children, you want to set them up for opportunities. You don't want them to have to struggle with their basic needs of food, shelter, clothing. You want to give them the opportunity to pursue their passions, correct? So how are you going to set them up to not be entitled? Because... Because in my experience, it does take a humbling. It does, and that's just one example of my story. I've been humbled in a lot of other ways. Um, but that's just one example where I was like, oh, I actually really appreciate what my grandmother did for me to exist. And because I, th I personally think that's what it takes. It takes, and it's usually later in life, because you can't comprehend this as a kid, but it's later in life where I've, I started to understand, oh, wow, my parents and my grandparents and probably my great grandparents sacrificed a lot for me to get to this place where I can sit here and complain about whether or not like the grocery store has the specific brand of food that I want because I'm a nutritionist and I'm a food snob, you know? Like my, a lot of people had to struggle for me to be able to complain about that. So I'm like, oh, oh. Uh, it's, it's humbling. So in your opinion, and maybe you can think about this as raising future children or, you know, or people in your life that you know, how does one grow up into a country like this and not be entitled? Two words, joint family. Huh. Okay. It's literally the solution to it. Okay. So talk about that. Okay. So the way the way it happens is like, how do we how do we learn a lot of things in life? It's not from textbooks. It's not from um, you know, what you hear. It's about the life stories. Mm -hmm. It's about people's experiences. That's yeah. how you learn the most. This is why I started this podcast. Yeah. It's your own experience as well as shared experiences. Exactly. That's where we learn. So how do you create these shared experiences? How do you understand? So for you to understand somebody's struggle, yeah. you need to you need to be around them. Yes. Um, exposed to, to ex it. Yes. Exposed to the struggle, right? So if your grandma um came here gave birth to you to your parents and just left your parents would have never understood the things that your grandma went through right because how do we pass things like how how was how was religion passed down how is um um history passed down all of them were passed down through stories stories right so powerful right so our stories define all the struggles that we did Right. Like you have children's t books that have these stories. You have these struggles from from like, you know, like the difficult times in the United States that are passed down through stories. Mm -hmm. Right. You mm -hmm. have various countries coming together based on stories. Yeah. Right. So these stories, like if you have firsthand access to to your grandma mm -hmm. sitting, sitting in the patio like on the swing and you sitting right next to her and and she tells you sarah let me tell you a time <laughs> yeah. which when, is exactly what happened <laughs> right you know what i'm saying that i think it requires two things one it requires you to have exposure to these stories yeah but it also requires Initially. 
That's the initial. That's like the seed planting. Right. But you need exposure to these stories. But at the same time, you need the ability to comprehend these stories. Right. right? And pull out all the good parts of these stories. So what is that? Age? Maturity? So there's no unit for measuring maturity. So I don't know what we could use that. But I guess it would be character. Like what your character, what your personality is, or what your... um, uh personality building is at that point uh like you know teenagers are always considered rebellious because at that point they're just trying to figure themselves out and then you just hate everything and you know um all of that stuff right but you got to get to a point where where you realize like okay i need to take a step back sit down and just think about why I am here, mm. how I got here. Mm. Like, it's not like my life does not begin with my age being one. My life begins all the way back to when somebody did something years ago. At least going back in history, that's whatever I have exposure to. So we could pretty much take this all the way back to the Big Bang. That's what you're saying. No, well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, no, no. So what, it's, what, we, it's, what I'm it's saying is that relevance. it was just like a it's random explosion, relevant. explosion somewhere, and we're here today. Yeah, thousands and thousands so and millions of years. We're talking specifically about our past and where we come from. I'm talking about the fact that you are not here because of you. Right. Right. You have done zero. To get to where you are today. Yeah. What you're doing right now is taking advantage of where you are. Yes. So even if you are today, even if you are the best engineers available in the market, or if you are, um, if you are like a great rocket scientist or whoever you are, you're just make, taking advantage of the opportunity that was given to you. You did not create absolutely anything right out of right well are you, you did not create this at right. all whatever uh, whatever um you do right now is is essentially a result of what your prior generations have done for yeah. you to get where you are if stars if, aligned i wouldn't even call it stars aligned <laughs> i w- i would call that so like you you play a game of poker right mm-hmm. so you get dealt cards Mm -hmm. what you do with those cards is how you define what your life looks like right right? you you don't complain about the cards you got you don't um you don't you don't complain to the dealer that hey you intentionally gave me these cards right those are the cards that you got and there are cards on the table and you play accordingly Either you fold, either you continue playing, either you put like $5 in the pot, you put $10 in the pot, whatever you do in the pot, whatever you get out of the pot is what you define your life to be. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you got to the table was something that was not Not your doing. Your doing. You got put on that table by somebody that that built upon somebody else's struggle. So there yeah. was like struggle, somebody built upon that that struggle, somebody yeah. built on that struggle, yeah. and you're in your yeah. life and you're struggling. I am not discounting anybody's struggle, right? It Struggle for it's me- It's different. Right, struggle for me depends on what your baseline is. So if you grew mm. up in, in, in America- That is so true. I appreciate that point so much. Go ahead. Okay, so if you grew up in, your, in America and for you, clean water, Wi-Fi, food, was your baseline? Baseline, I know. Right. So if, if you, <laughs> which grew, it is reality, yes. Right. So you grew up in that baseline. Freedom, all the freedoms I have. Okay, we're not gonna go there. <laughs> I'm just saying, as a woman, comparatively, I have more freedoms in this country than a lot. Hundred percent. Yeah. And I'm not gonna touch that subject. No, right we're now. not gonna <laughs> touch this up. But I'm just saying, I just wanted yes, to throw that I, one out there because that's a big one I think about agree. a lot. Hundred <laughs> percent. If if you're a female, United States is the best country you could ever be in, right now, yeah. right now. Yeah. Right. Um, but anyways, um, so I was talking about the fact that um, that you get to this table, um, and your baseline, right, is uh, clean water, Wi-Fi, 
and whatever, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then one day your Wi-Fi stops working for two hours <laughs> and you cry about it, right? And then you would have other people. So now I'm being the devil's advocate, yeah, right? Yeah. And you have other people that say, hey, why are you crying about no Wi-Fi? We're, we're in this place where we have no water. And, and for me, it's like, hey, you need to understand the fact that um, this person's baseline is Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. Your baseline is no water. When you get water, you're happy about it. And your or, sorry, or, or, or your baseline is just water. And when yeah. your water stops, you're like, hey, um, struggle. And for this other person, their baseline is Wi-Fi. And when the Wi-Fi drops or when the Wi-Fi is not, you know, 100 gigabytes a second you're like oh shit why is it so slow exactly so it all depends on baselines but we also need to understand that baselines are different for different people and baselines change and they change yes and um so i'm at some point i am like you do need humility and the uh, on the other side i do understand the struggles of people that that we call first world problems right i understand like you have a baseline you grew up with that baseline right I right? imagine your baseline has changed a lot well, for what you expect of your life or or at least what you your what you understand to be like your baseline of functioning. Right. I imagine that's changed yeah, a lot throughout I, your I life. I went from um electricity only 2 days uh, a week to uh if I, if I have a if I have like even one second of no electricity I'm like shit that's a problem now. Right. Yeah. So exactly. I, I, your baseline understand- changed. I I'm do sure understand you understand that, that but, more than most. But for me, I would not make a deal about that two seconds of electricity drop because I lived in a time right. in because my life. Because you can recollect your own experience, whereas right. we have to think about someone else's experience. You have to think about your lineage's experience. Yeah, so you yeah, have to yeah. think about an experience that you're genetically tied to. Mm. Okay, and at this point in our lives, especially in in America, I feel that people try to disconnect themselves from yeah. other people, especially yeah. their families, so much um, that th- that mm. they're losing connection to so much knowledge, to so much growth, to yeah. so much um, experience that other people had and then they're trying to do they're trying to make the same mistakes over and over again so it's that thing where you say oh i'm not going to look at my history anymore because history doesn't repeat itself kicker (laughs) right and i'm gonna live my own life it's autonomy i want autonomy i want the freedom to live life how i want to live and i don't want anyone or anything to be able to tell me how that's supposed to go but then you're literally discounting all the work and effort that went into you even having the idea of knowing what autonomy is so then question for you do you think at some point maybe in this generation when i say this generation is gen z or the generations after that we will come to a point where they are going to use this statement like hey you need to be humble you need to um you know not be entitled etc etc as their profound statements Mm -hmm. because they have crashed and burned so many times that their profound statement is what the original statement was well you know i think will it do a full circle oh absolutely because it always does doesn't it like i like to see uh like if you look if you look at history we always have these waves, right? Mm -hmm. We've got these like moral highs, lows, highs, lows. We've got, and in any culture, you can see this. And so we tend to, I I think it's pretty, pretty obvious that we tend to kind of rebel against the extreme. It's like a pendulum swing, right? We, our parents, we're maybe all, all all the way on one side. And so naturally, we're going to swing all the way to the other side. What do you mean by naturally? I mean, depending upon their experience and their struggle. So like, again, our, so, I mean, it's different, obviously, for everybody. But when you look at, say, just what your parents went through, okay, their experience, 
we, as their children, tend to look at them and say, ooh, they did all these things wrong. They did they maybe did some things right, right? But we look at the things, we definitely look at the things they did wrong because we were hurt by them. And so we say, ooh, I'm not going to do that. And a lot of times what we do is swing all the way to the other side because we think the exact opposite thing is somehow the right thing when it's probably somewhere in the middle of those things. This is going to turn into a therapy session. <laughs> the way this is going. Because, well, and I mean, this is just life though. Like, because again, we're looking, we're not talking, because uh, we, I feel like the the discussion has been a lot about looking at our past and understanding our experiences and figuring out how those relate to our present life. So we're not looking at the future. I mean, you just asked a question about the future though. Like, what do we, what about future generations? Are we going to come full circle? And the only way to answer that is to look at the past because this is our, these are our only data points, right? We don't, we can't see the future, you know, unless you have some magic I don't know about. Uh, well, we could, we could predict it. I mean, we can have predictions, but right? But again, on, uh, you know, you, you could ask Chad GPT for it. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. That's some freaky stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting because we, I agree with you that we have to have, we have to take into consideration our past. If we just look at ourselves as our present moment and we just try and erase everything that's happened before us, we will be nowhere, right? We have to look at what, not only what we've learned through our life, but what the people before us have learned and experienced and grown. I think that is so important because why because how can we progress as a society even if we're not looking at these things but again i so i i think i think there's never just like a i think there's everything happens in waves right there's always there's always it's sort of this pendulum swing effect where we're trying to somehow reach balance in the middle but and who knows if we ever will but when when one extreme happens, so like the extreme of, say, war and poverty, that's an extreme. You're not even given the basic needs for survival. You have to fight for them. So now we've swung to the other side where you are given the basic needs for survival. So what are you going to do with them? And that's where entitlement happens. Oh, well, those are required for me. Because, and so my struggles are now, you know, whether or not my internet is working or whether or not, you know, my friends have liked my Facebook pictures. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. So, you know, the struggles have changed, but you're right. It's about this baseline because the baseline was different. So, so you're asking me, where's the pendulum going to swing next? If in the next generation, it's going to swing because they're going to combat us because that's what we do. We combat, we go against, we look at the failures of the previous generation. We say, Ooh, how can we fix that? Let's try. And usually we come up with some other extreme that's probably still has its flaws because we're human. We're, we've got the flaws. So, question then. Yeah. How, how do we, how do we know that? That is where the previous generation failed. So good question. To 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 expand on that, right? So you're 12 years old, right? Yeah. Um, and um you have been told not to do XYZ. Uh-huh. Uh, and you think that maybe I want to do that. <laughs> Cause right? that's what every kid thinks. Right. The um, things their parents tell them not to do, they're like, hmm. Maybe I should do that and see what happens. Right. Um, and then um, you actually do it. You mess up. And then you blame <laughs> your parents for not <laughs> explaining it to you properly. Mm. And then you consider that as that generation's flaw and then swing the pendulum. My question is that is that really the right way to look at this thing? Uh, is that really... They're like, 
communication is a two-part thing, right? There's like me saying something and then you comprehending something, mm -hmm. right? So if I, I like to call that head knowledge versus heart knowledge, because head knowledge is like, I've heard it. My brain accepts that I've heard it, but I'm not actually acting it out in my life. So That's hearing versus listening. Knowledge. Yes. Something like Go that. Go ahead. Right. So the idea is like, okay, so they said something. You understood something. Yeah. Based on your limited understanding of the current situation, you decide that maybe this is not the right way to express something. Mm-hmm. Without even understanding what they're trying to say. Right. Then you act in a rebellious way to Towards it. Towards it, yes. And then you say that you are on the opposite side of this pendulum now. Right. Just because you failed to understand what the original idea was. So what you're talking about is the teenage phase. You're talking about this rebellion. I don't think it's just the teenage. It's not just the teenage phase, but again... You're talking about that point because this is a point that every human, I think, experiences if they're given enough life to experience it, right? Where we have we have the ideas because because our parents can't inject their memories or their feelings or whatever into us. They they just tell us, hey, don't do that. And they do they say that because they probably did that in the past and didn't work. So they say, hey, don't do that. And we're like, okay. Hmm. It's head knowledge, we've been told. But we're like, but we don't have heart understanding to actually realize how that actually manifests in our life and what the consequences actually are. Maybe they communicated it, maybe they didn't. Maybe they told us, hey, don't do don't do drugs because it can lead to, you know, addiction and all these other problems. Maybe they told us that. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just said, hey, don't do drugs. And they didn't tell us why. Right. But again, we take that as our young selves and we rebel always because that's what young people do, because we have to. We're inquisitive. There's this wonder. There's this mystery. We have to go figure it out. So then you get to that point where you try and then you get your own experience. Maybe it was good. Maybe it was bad. So the question is, why do you have to rebel to be curious? Like you could just because, question. You could just question like Because why? that's what doubt is. You could. You could. That's doubt. Why? Well, why? Why question, do I have to yes, do this? Yes. You could doubt something. Yeah. Without having to rebel. I mean, yes, you can. Oh, I agree because I did that a lot. I wasn't, I mean, my parents told me things, hey, don't do this. And I didn't do them, but I still questioned it. I still was like, well, why, why shouldn't I? And I started searching for answers. So I did it in a way that was sort of safer. But again, uh, that's the thing. I think you're looking at the, the almost teenage adolescent version of this because again when you get to a place where and we all go through different we all go through life at different paces mm -hmm. right but generally speaking uh we all know like we all kind of stereotype the teenage phase as the one who rebels right because we're trying to figure out ourselves and have a little bit more independence from our parents question then yeah do, so when you go to school at the same time yeah do you treat your classroom teachers the ones that are telling you hey do this don't do this and you know this is what the history is this is what the geography is this is what the science is and you're inquisitive and right. you ask questions right do you judge them the same way you judge your parents I think that's a big it depends questions question because I did. But do you treat them the same way? I mean, where you're like, I, did. I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to be disrespectful. Well, I'm gonna it's tell not, you that but you again, don't it's not, shit. it's not a, di well, I never disrespected my parents and I definitely never disrespected my teachers oh. because I was brought up that way. But so I think that's neither, I think, I think what you're trying to get at is, uh, and, and I appreciate this point because 
It's an authoritative figure that says, hey, this is how the world works. And as a kid, when you're learning, or as an adolescent, as you're learning, uh, I think that depends on the person's character as to how they respond. Because some, some do just blatantly rebel. I was not a blatantly rebellious kid. I really wasn't. Like, my, my parents thought I was perfect until I slowly proved them otherwise once I was in my 30s. Wow. Exactly. Anyway. So you're a teenage now. <laughs> no, it's again, it's it's I hid it from them because I wanted them to think I was perfect. So it was more of a people pleasing on my end. But but that's neither here nor there. Again, it's the idea of like, OK, how did I deal with authority? How did I deal with someone telling me, hey, this is the way life is and then figuring out life for myself? Well, so from my experience and I can't really, you know, I think I think everyone goes through this slightly differently. Um, but we all have a common experience of that. We all have authority of figures in our life, whether it be our parents or teachers or coaches or whatever that tell us, hey, this is the way this thing is done. If you want to achieve X, you do Y, you know, um, and we have to take that. And a lot of times when you're a kid, you kind of just are like, OK, and you kind of go with it. But then you start to realize, hmm. Could I find a more fun way to do this? But but the reality is as you mature, because I've already experimented with and questioned and doubted a lot of the things my parents taught me, my teachers taught me, everybody. And so as you mature as an adult, it's like, okay, that was baby food, right? Like they were giving me the essence of life and I had to take that and figure out what my life looked like. And so I went through many phases of rebelling in my own way, questioning, doubting, trying my own thing. But then, you know, I'll say more into my 30s, I was like, oh, well, huh, I've, I can look at my past and I can look at my parents' past because I can have conversations with them that are like, huh, well, what did you experience? Like, I can get more details, right? But then I have to say, okay, taking all of my experiences, taking all of my parents' experiences, maybe even some of my grandparents' experiences that I know about, how do I live life? How do I live life now? What do I, what am I choosing into? What am I choosing? Am I choosing to grow in positive, healthy ways that benefit me and others? Or am I choosing just me? Or am I choosing just others? Because I was a people pleaser for a long time. So I know what that's like. Um, and so it's, it's, there, it's like, it's maturing from this baby food concept or like getting fed milk of like, here's information and the basic understanding of like, okay, am I going to rebel against this or am I going to just accept this? And then you start to mature and now you're eating whole food and you're saying, okay, well, I have my experiences. I have other people's experiences. So now what do I do? And I think that's the stage of life that I'm in right now is it's no longer baby food that I'm chewing on. I have the basic head knowledge. But now I'm like, okay, but how do I want that to manifest in my heart and how I act, how I treat other people and how I treat myself? So there's levels to this. And so I think it's very, I think it's hard to just say, oh, well, there's just this rebellious phase and not, or or whatever. I think it's like, oh, no, well, we digest the information that we're given differently now because we have our own experiences. We have enough life experiences, but we also have talked to other people, hopefully our parents as well, and gotten their experiences. So all this feeds into how we start to perceive our own experience and that falls right into like entitlement. It starts to play into, well, do I deserve these things or do I have to work for them? So what if what if your parents, instead of telling you that this is how life is, they tell you like, hey, this is how your grandma or grandpa lived life. Mm -hmm. This is how I live life. Mm -hmm. These are our learnings. Yeah. Use it to your advantage. Yeah. Would that be like a better way of presenting the information from the past so that you make better future decisions. All right, we're going to take a pee break. Yes. So that the answer is yes. right there. 
So, yeah, I would say, I would say, first of all, yes, that's a better way. But I, I'll say that with the caveat of, of this, because you, the way you phrased it specifically, I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. But in reality, what I think happens is that parents don't give, don't always give you the freedom They give you their expectation. So it's not like, hey, I'm going to give you all this information and I hope you go do good things with it. They say, hey, I'm going to give you all this information and I'm going to expect you to adhere to this. I think that's the most common experience for a lot of people is expectation versus like a hope, right? Like, hey, I hope you go do this, but also you still have the freedom to choose. And so I think that's where the rebellion even come f- comes from. So rules versus guidelines. Yes, exactly. So when you have hard, fast rules, there's not a human alive that won't, unless, unless of course, it's, there's just fear involved of like, if I go against this, I might die or something bad might happen. But, you know, I mean, that's an experience we all have. When there's hard, fast rules, we're like, hmm. Wait, what happens if I don't do that? Right? So I think, I think, like, if I imagine having my own children, for example, I would want to, just what you said, I would want to tell them about my experiences and my parents' experiences. And hopefully, you know, I would hope that at least my mom would be around to be able to tell them her own version, right? But, uh, but I think what is also important is that, you know, if we don't give the generation after us the freedom to think, they're going to do it anyway. So I think it's very beneficial to say, hey, this is, this is what I've experienced. This is my reality. This is, this is like what I've found to work. But I understand you're a different human being than I am. Even though you have my genetics, even though you, you know, you've got and and I've raised you, I still want you to realize that you have the choice of who you want to be, given all the things, you know, not that not not to make it unrealistic for them, because that's, you know, that was also a thing that parents did for a while. You can be whatever you want to be. Participation trophies. And we all know, well, that's not exactly true either, right? Because we all have limitations. We know this as humans. So I think it's like, okay, one, let's be realistic. But also, you do still have the freedom to choose. And I think we have to give, we have to give the people in our lives, you know, like our children, for example, the freedom to choose, knowing that they might choose something that is going to hurt us. And I think that's that's always hard for any parent. Like I and I know this because I literally have just been going through this with my mom where I'm choosing something that she would have never chosen for herself. And I'm saying, "Okay, mom, but I'm not you." And I grew up totally different. And that doesn't change at all how much I love you and how much I care about you and how much I respect you and the fact that you had to go through so much to get me to where I am now. But I'm also not you. So while I want those, I think my mom did a fabulous job, by the way. My parents did a fabulous job raising me, so I have to commend them for that. And while I wanted to hear those experiences and see those experience. Experiences and even just looking at their relationship, I'm like, yeah, like that's they had a beautiful marriage that has greatly impacted me. But I'm also not my mom and I also didn't grow up in the 70s. So things are a little different for me. And so while I want to take those experiences, I also have to recognize that I have my own experiences and so I have to use everything that I've gotten and mold that into what I feel is my path and my journey. And it's okay for me to fail and make mistakes and learn and grow and 
choose something else. But when it's an expectation, when it's a, hey, this is how you have to live life, that's where, because for me, that was crippling. I li- I chose things out of the fear of how people were going to see me and if I was going to get their approval and love rather than choose things for myself. Now, a lot of times you see the opposite. It's the complete rebellion. I didn't rebel. I conformed because I thought I had to in order to keep the love of the people who I care about. Until I got to the point where I was like, this is crippling me and I'm not actually getting the things that I want to pursue. So something has to give. So in regards to that. So essentially, freedom, stories, and um, trust would trust. essentially, yeah. um, you know, um, solve the issue. Um, so yeah, on on that note, uh, let's land this plane, huh? Yeah. All right. It was it was lovely having you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I had a great time, and uh, we should do this more often. Yeah, for sure. All right. Anytime. All right. Of course. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you later. Bye bye.